first Polish immigrants arrived to St. Louis in 1834. In 1878, the Archdiocese of St. Louis granted permission to establish a parish and build the first Polish church in St. Louis. The permission to establish a Polish parish was granted, but without any financial support from the archdiocese. Polish immigrants had to come up with their own funds to build and maintain the Polish Roman Catholic Church and parish in St. Louis. Within a few years, it became evident that a larger church was needed. In 1891, a cornerstone was blessed for the present St. Stanislaus Koska Church. With the consent of the Archbishop, Peter Richard Kendrick, on May 2, 1891, the parish was made a corporation in the state of Missouri. The legal name of the civil corporation, which would hold the title to the parish property, was the Polish Roman Catholic St. Stanislaus Koska Parish. A set of corporation bylaws were then created to help manage the corporation. The pastor of St. Stanislaus at the time, Father Stanowski, remained under the jurisdiction of the Archbishop while serving as the first president and treasurer of the corporation. In 1890s, St. Stanislaus had about 2,300 parishioners. In addition to the church, a school was founded and run at the Franciscan Sisters. St. Louis Polonia became enriched by a new influx of immigrants in the 1940s and then again throughout the 1980s following the formation of Solidarity Movement in Poland. In between these influxes, the area around the parish began to deteriorate. In the 1950s, Prude Igo Public Housing was built adjacent to St. Stanislaus and it had a deep effect on the parish. Pruitt Igo was finally closed and demolished in the 1970s. Because of the surrounding area, the church itself was in desperate need of repairs. New efforts to restore the Polish Roman Catholic Church began under the leadership of Father Jaco, who had been transferred from Irish St. Patrick's Parish. His transfer came as St. Patrick's Church was sold by the Archdiocese and the church was demolished. The statue of St. Patrick from that church was then installed in St. Stanislaus Church as a symbol of friendship and support which the Polish community received from other ethnic groups while trying to make home in St. Louis. The Shrine of St. Joseph, the mother church of German Catholics, was faced with a similar fate as St. Patrick's Church. A Polish priest, Father Filipiak, along with some friends of St. Joseph's Church, were able to spare this ethnic church from being leveled. They worked very hard to come up with a clever plan to save this church. Father Filipiak secretly repaired a roof with his own savings without the archdiocese's knowledge while securing a historic registry for the parish. Father Filipiak kept telling people that he would die for St. Joseph's Church. And so it was. He was killed during a robbery that transpired in the dark of the night while asleep in the parish rectory. The Shrine of St. Joseph survived and continues to serve the St. Louis community. In 1969, an unforgettable event happened in the life of St. Stanislaus Church. Cardinal Karol Wojtyla, now St. John Paul II, visited St. Louis and St. Stanislaus Koska Church. The former pontiff's charismatic personality and his exceptionally generous spirit touched the lives of many parishioners. His visit helped with fundraising efforts to restore St. Stanislaus Church. In 1976, St. Stanislaus Koska Church was recognized as St. Louis City Landmark, and then in 1979, the church was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. The new influx of Polish immigrants in the 1980s brought refreshed ways to celebrate Polish heritage at St. Stanislaus Koska Parish. The new immigrants did not have much money to support the parish financially, but they were determined to make St. Stanislaus Koska Parish thrive. They made significant efforts to enhance Polish language and culture at the parish, and they also volunteered in many spiritual, social, and educational events. The parishioners of St. Stanislaus knew that there were two distinct groups at St. Stanislaus known as Old Polonia and New Polonia. They didn't always get along, but each had its special purpose in the life and prosperity of the parish. 
That is when Monsignor Ted Wojcicki joined to lead the parish. Monsignor Ted had deep roots as his family once lived and was very deeply involved in the life of St. Stanislaus Koska Parish. During Monsignor Ted Wojcicki's time, the parish prospered and new efforts to build a new Polish Heritage Center were made. The area around St. Stanislaus Koska was revitalized and the parish site and its surroundings gained in value. During a two-year period, over $2.7 million was raised for the parish to complete the construction of the Polish Heritage Center. Then, on May 19, 2002, Archbishop Justin Regali approved the project and personally participated in the opening celebration. While St. Stanislaus parishioners were celebrating the new growth of the parish, a conflict between the Archdiocese of St. Louis and the St. Stanislaus Koska Board of Directors began to escalate. A new pastor had been appointed to the parish, Father Philip Benet. Soon after, the Archdiocese filed a lawsuit against the Board of Directors in efforts to dissolve the St. Stanislaus Koska Parish Corporation. The lawsuit was filed in response to the Board of Directors not complying with the original bylaws of the corporation. The conflict caused divisions within the St. Stanislaus Koska parishioners. In 2012, the court sided with St. Stanislaus Corporation, stating that the church belonged to the corporation and therefore the court did not have the authority to rule on the religion of the church. In turn, the parish was required to remove the word Roman from its name and branding. This broke the original intent of the Polish parish founders, who sacrificed in order to build a Polish Roman Catholic parish in St. Louis to serve generations of ethnic Roman Catholics. There was a lot of discussion about it for years. There was discussion among the board of directors. Uh, there was discussion um, um, from the parish council, discussion among the uh, parishioners in general. So it was pretty obvious that uh, a newer and more modern hall would benefit the service of the people. We had uh, the, the school hall was there at the time. It was uh, on the top floor, as was done back in the 19th century. Uh, sometimes halls were built at the top of buildings rather than the bottom. And it was, it was a, a very useful facility, but it was aged and a uh, little, little rough around the edges. And then uh, in the neighborhood also was the Polish Falcons Hall, which was uh, useful. But uh, as things changed over time, uh, people became uh, uh, to desire more facilities which were more handicap accessible, which perhaps were safer uh, and uh, would uh, provide a solid foundation for the, for the future. We came to St. Louis in the 1990s and we studied at St. Louis University. As a teenager, I recall driving to St. Stanislaus, passing through a neighborhood filled with vacant and abandoned homes. It was a heartbreaking view. And then we would get to the parking lot of St. Stanislaus, our parish, and the church was alive. It felt like entering an oasis in the middle of a desert. A lot of important events happened at St. Stanislaus. Some of our friends got married. Our oldest son was baptized here. During the annual Polka Mass, people from the wider community came to celebrate. This was the place where people prayed, socialized, and networked. And then, all of a sudden, we were asked to leave and go somewhere else if we wanted to stay Roman Catholic. Well, the best part was I could go to church, and uh, right away I had a game, so it was kind of, it was very convenient, you know, it, it was just awesome, you know, and being Polish, and then, which in my country, Poland, soccer is a very uh, dominant sport, I always loved it, so being Polish and then being able to play, and the people that actually play in this league was a lot, a lot of foreigners, most of them were foreigners, so it was just the best, you know, somebody could join share your joys with them, you know. Now that you have heard a little bit about the vibrant parish life of St. Stanislaus, 
It is important to begin understanding the way in which the corporation of Polish Roman Catholic St. Stanislaus Koska Parish was governed. Although the corporation of St. Stanislaus Koska Polish Roman Catholic Parish was financially independent, it was not independent of the archdiocese and governance. The original board of directors wrote and passed 12 bylaws to dictate the governance of the parish. According to the first bylaw, the church was meant to be Roman Catholic and the priest was to be assigned by the archbishop. The rest of the bylaws outlined the structure of the board of directors and the parish. It wasn't until the 1990s and early 2000s that newer board members that included Mr. Edward Flora were elected. Mr. John Barash was appointed to the board in 1988. Mr. Barash and the others who served with him on the board at the time were chosen by the pastor based on how much a person worked for the parish. Since then, the bylaws were changed by the board of directors and former pastors to include bylaws on topics such as parish restoration funds, elections of board members, and board term limits. Some changes to the church's governance aggravated the Archdiocese of St. Louis. According to the book, Unyielding Spirit, published in 2006, the priest assigned to the parish, Father Philip Benet, as parish administrator, notified the board that the parish operating funds and emergency funding totaling $60,000 had been exhausted by him. Father Benet refused to account for any of the money, at the insistence of the parishioners, the board of directors took charge of Sunday collections. The archbishop disapproved of the board's removing finances from the priest's sole control. Then the archdiocese removed the parochial administrator and his assistant and did not replace them. After this incident in 2006, the archdiocese of St. Louis wrote to the Missouri Attorney General Jeremiah Nixon saying, in the past few years, the Board of Directors had modified the corporation's bylaws and had essentially separated itself from the control of the Archbishop. The conflict between the directors of the corporation and the Archdiocese consists of the fact that the directors refused to abide by his authority as Archbishop of St. Louis. In this conflict, a representative of the directors of the corporation even appealed to the Pope, the ultimate worldly authority of the Roman Catholic Church, to ask the Pope to side with them. This appeal was responded to by the Congregation for the Clergy, the delegated representative agency of the Vatican speaking for the Pope, which stated the board of directors of this corporation has, quote, attempted to transform St. Stanislaus into an entity which has no resemblance to a parish as envisioned by either the traditional or the current law of the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. The Congregation for the Clergy then asked for the Corporation to cooperate with Archbishop Burke to restore the parish to the status of a parish of the Roman Catholic Church. The bylaws had most recently been changed in 2013. With these bylaws came one of the most notable changes to St. Stanislaus, the name. Once named Polish Roman Catholic St. Stanislaus Koska Parish, the co Corporation is now named St. Stanislaus Corporation, this name misses three key words, Polish, Roman, Catholic. Now you will hear more in depth about the parish governance, financial independence, and what happened to St. Stanislaus Koska Roman Catholic Parish as understood by those in the parish community. So in the end of the 90s, um, Archbishop Regali at the time, or then he became Cardinal Regali, started looking at the financial situation that was happening in the archdiocese. And, uh, um, you know, there's different uh, mindsets as far as what the money was to be used for, whether it was for the archdiocese itself or whether to fund the Vatican or whatever it may be. But the point being is that the archbishop or cardinal at the time wanted to uh, gain some more funds for the diocese. Um, in doing so, he wanted to close down some of the parishes, grow the bottom lines in those uh, communities um, by assimilating those funds back into the archdiocese and then um, reincorporating those parishes and basically uh, putting them back in the debt on their own um, so that the parishioners would then be uh, 
responsible for whatever debt those parishes incurred and not the diocese itself. Um, so that, that basically it made the diocese more liquid in capital and cash uh, than they had been. Um, they did still control some of the properties. What he also started was a process um, that they had started within the United States at the time uh, of transferring over all the parishes to um, the diocese as incorporated as for ownership. Uh, prior to that time, all the in parishes were individually incorporated. And so the parishioners had their own corporation locally at that level, wherever the parish existed, and they could control the finances, the property, and basically the maintenance and upkeep of the, of the church itself. Um, by changing all this over, then the diocese wouldn't have any resistance because they controlled everything um, as far as uh, being able to shut things down, take the money as they needed, as they saw fit, um, and then uh, move on uh, with their resources as far as priests or deacons or whatever else. Um, there were still, St. Stanislaus was one of seven parishes at the time when all this stuff started that still uh, remained individually incorporated and we resisted that change. Uh, there were two others that were basically civil corporations and then the remaining ones were uh, pastoral corporations that were run by their priests um, like the ones out with the priory priests at St. Anselm's and uh, the Vincentians had St. Vincent de Paul and uh, um, St. Uh, Catherine Labore. And then you also had uh, institutions such as high schools that were run by the uh, the different uh, orders as well, such as uh, the Marianists who controlled St. Mary's High School and Vianney High School and the Jesuits controlling St. Louis University High School. Those were, you know, examples. One of the other civil corporations was St. Francis Xavier Church, which really wasn't run by the Jesuits. It's run by a civil corporation that was created outside of the college, which is also why it's nicknamed the College Church. And it still remains that way as well. Um, but uh, the diocese didn't want to take on the power of the, the Jesuits to change that over, so they let it stay the way it was. Um, but in doing so, and, and now there also is discussion uh, with a deadline with the new Archbishop Rosansky in the St. Louis Archdiocese that he wants to further do this. Um, and they set a deadline of 2023 now to do even more consolidation and more reincorporation. So they plan on, you know, uh, doing some more downsizing basically in the Archdiocese of both property and, and funds. Um, the big thing is you'll notice that some of the parishes change names. And when they do that, what they do is they unincorporate or dissolve the corporation basically of that particular parish and eliminate that name. And then they create a new corporation by giving it a new name. Um, it was under the guise of modernization or modern saints or you know however you wanna look at it. Um, but in effect, what it was doing was all covering the legalities of taking one corporation, dissolving it, assimilating all the funds from that corporation into the coffers of the diocese, and then putting the burden of running the parish financially back onto the parishioners by creating the new corporation and putting it in debt from point one. My understanding would be that the, the parish from when it was founded, it was uh, understood uh, that the, the Polish people would control their own finances. Um, I remember uh, seeing actually some of the documents which established a, a board of trustees. So the board of trustees um, actually uh, owned the buildings uh, and owned the property and was uh, responsible uh, for uh, the, the funding of the parish and, and the upkeep of the, of the facilities. So that was a uh, not uncommon tradition with immigrants to the United States. Uh, they had, <clears throat> they typically, the, the immigrants typically had such a pride in their own heritage and wanted to do things their own way. Now Mr. Florek will explain how the finances of the corporation were handled. Finances was handled officially on the meetings. So the meeting was taking 
twice monthly or as needed. On this meeting was the secretary who were taking minutes of the meeting and everything was written down. And then on meetings we would decide what we need, how we will collect the needs, what we have to do, do we have to uh, make some events to, to, to get the, the money or use personal contact. We will do, make decision if do we need, uh, how we will raise the money and also for what we will raise the money. And then we will say, this will cost that much. This will cost that much. And we will write this. If we decide it, then we will do it. If we don't decide it, then we will change our thinking. So also meeting was very beneficial because it was four, six people who will bend together and think together. And then after that, we'll go and on the mass or on the public meeting with the parishioners, we will tell them that our uh, Polish Heritage Center will cost us several million dollars. So do we need this? They say yes, because we are older and we cannot climb on third, play, uh, third floor to have dinner or to have dance or to have meetings. So that they decided we were providing them information. And now, in my opinion, no board member will, will decide, even priest, priest was president of the board, but no one, no individual person will decide, uh, incognito, so to speak, how we will do this or how much this will cost. Everything was written down, it was receipts, and the uh, financial secretary, one of the board of members will, will write this and we will have in the book. The money which we had was enough money to sustain us. The, for example, every 10 years, the church outside or had to be sealed because of weak uh, bricks. So every, it cost us $10,000, I don't know right now. So we had enough money compared to other parishes because we couldn't depend on help. Other parishes could ask Archdiocese and say, well, I need $100,000. So they, they will say, okay, for what? Let us think. And then we see how we can help you. Help you because the, the, there was also available loans from the Archdiocese, and then Paris pay back, and everybody were happy. Now we couldn't, uh, we couldn't have this. So we have to think. On the final answer is like this. We, we were always aware of our needs, of our expenses, and we were going down. We would say to parishioners, well, you have to contribute more, either financially or physically. So lots of people were contributing physically. Instead of hiring somebody to do something, well, they will come and, and work. So our expenses were low. We had volunteers who could be in 50 or 100 on big events. And then everybody were doing something. So we were saving like this too. Every parish had been operating under a certain way. And when Archbishop Burke came, he decided that all parishes should. And there's no exceptions. And I guess that's what led to his uh, 
his inquiry as to why St. Stanislaus wasn't in conformity with the rest of the parishes. Um, it had everything to do with uh, who had power over the, the finances. It had nothing to do that I know of paying off any kinds of lawsuits. And uh, Again, I have no idea on what led to it, except that Archbishop Burke felt that every parish should be operating the same way. There should be a consistency in all parishes. And there was an inconsistency with St. Stanislaus that he saw. That's the way he saw it. Yeah. What, the reason why they targeted St. Stanislaus at the time, uh, which was in, back in 2003, was when they first communicated their desire to do so, um, was because there was growth that was communicated from uh, developers in the area. And that land that St. Stanislaus sits on um, is subject to um, being able to be purchased, vacant land being purchased for a dollar. Um, by anyone else that owns the majority property for a city block. With St. Bridget's being on the opposite corner of that city block, and if the diocese would own St. Stanislaus, they would be majority owner. They could purchase that vacant land, which was Pruitt Igo, for a dollar, and then sell it to the developers who were looking at that land for future development. At the time, there was discussion for what became fruition for NGA, the National Geospatial Agency. This is back in 2003, and, and you know a lot of people didn't know that was already happening, but we did have an insight on that because um, Mayor Francis Slay, he, his mother, uh, who was Polish, also belonged to our parish. Um, so we had privy information from him as well as from the people in the assessor's office and the planning and development offices in the city of St. Louis as to what was happening. One of our directors, Bill Bialchuk, was also uh, tied into that with his um, parking lots and his towing business. And um, so he was able to communicate that information back to us as well. So we knew full well what was happening and what was transpiring and what the actual reason was. They wanted to sell off the property and, and uh, to developers and then gain the cash flow from it. And then later through the process, we also discovered that they were talking about with the new bridge being built across the Mississippi River, uh, which was at that time in the planning phases that they wanted to make the exit ramp uh, onto Jefferson Avenue right there by St. Stanislaus um, coming up Cass Avenue. Um, by them not taking that over and being able to sell it, um, to the city, then that also had to change those planning um, features as well as part of the bridge, which is why they dropped it further down toward 12th Street and 14th Street then. Well, we didn't have option, you know, we had several meetings in the chancery with the Archbishop. And then he decided that he cannot give up the our church to our hands so if we don't give up church to him we'll be excommunicated because he thought that well once he excommunicated then people will leave the church and or chase directors and then everything will be fine so the main reason i already stated they were excommunicated because they didn't want to give up church. And it was not single excommunication. It was, was, it was, um, was uh, all members of the board and all, some other uh, issues, uh, same issue, uh, that they were excommunicated. Um, now on the subject though, I was first board of member who after we lost everything and I didn't see any channel or any way of a short reviving the situation when we lost in court, when we lost in, in um, with uh, Archdiocese and Archbishop then I decided that I will seek that uh, his uh, taking my excommunication off. So I uh, make arrangement and 
met him in his office and he took Magyar's communication off uh, because I wanted to do one thing, one thing that show people that you cannot fix, you cannot deviate from the God and you cannot, you cannot, if you cannot do any more good that you should take care of yourself, your religion and your other people. So that was the, uh, my idea. Also, I want to say that several priests were rewarding me with accepting me on the masses. Why I was excommunicated, I was not supposed to take, go to mass and I supposed to take communion and everything else. And quite few priests didn't agree with this. And quite few priests Tell me, don't worry about. You go to church, you pray, and you should be happy. But I want to settle the situation the the right way for the church. Contrary to Mr. Florek, former board member of Saint Stanislaus John Barash says, "I am still excommunicated because I did not do anything about it." I believe that I did not do anything wrong to get excommunicated, so I still have the papers and I look at them every once in a while. I consider myself a holy roller now. Any church I roll into, they don't know that I'm excommunicated. I go there for mass and get communion. I felt sorry for them. On the other hand, they were the ones that were excommunicated were fully informed of what the consequences of their actions would be. Uh, the rest of the folks who were just kind of just simply, they just simply wanted to have their Polish mass uh, in the language that they loved, in the, tr in the traditions that they loved. They wanted to have that continued. And um, when their, the priest was taken away, they just decided, well, let's just get a Polish priest up here and do it. I'm not sure the average Polish immigrant person in the pews knew of the ramifications of what hiring Father Bozak would, would accomplish. I think later on, after Father Bozak decided to, to kind of change some of the ways that the, the place was operating, alienated some of the, the traditional Polish folks, namely some of the people he was attracting to become members of that congregation, some folks who found didn't find themselves welcome in, in a Catholic church because of a lot of reasons. So um, when the vote finally took place, I think that probably was years later when a vote was taken whether or not to accept a, a compromise that Archbishop Carlson had, had offered. I think he offered to once again restore it as a Catholic church, bring in a pastor. In fact, a, a Polish priest who you may know, Father, Mar his ego is by Marco. His name is Michael Marcelleski. He's a Jesuit uh, and uh, very well known uh, in the in the Jesuit community at St. Louis University and, and, and in Desmet. In 2010, some parishioners of St. Stanislaus continued their efforts to regain the parish's Roman Catholic status. This letter outlines the intentions of Archbishop Carlson to help resolve the conflict. The following are some excerpts from this letter. As a beginning, I want to express my appreciation for your desire to resolve the matter. I read with interest the statement in the newspaper attributed to Marek Bozek that if it is necessary for him to step aside, he is willing to do so as long as he knows that the members of St. Stanislaus will not go without pastoral care and the sacraments. I assure you that if and when this matter is appropriately resolved, the parishioners of St. Stanislaus will receive pastoral care and the sacraments once again at St. Stanislaus. Given his status, it is necessary that Marek Bozek step aside and that a pastor be appointed by me as archbishop in order for the suppression of the parish to be removed and the parish reconstituted. It will also be necessary for the parish civilly to be restructured so that the pastor and the archbishop have the authority required for them under canon law. To do this, I have in our earlier discussions and am now proposing that the 1891 Bylaws of St. Stanislaus Corporation be reinstated with one amendment. This is that any future amendments to the Articles of Agreement or the Bylaws require the approval of the Archbishop. 
St. Stanislaus would be permitted to have this unique structure different from all other parishes of the Archdiocese. Archbishop Carlson goes on to say, I believe that this structure which serves St. Stanislaus from 1891 to 2000 can serve the needs of the parish for the future. Because of the unique nature of these commitments, I will need to seek approval from the Holy See before this proposal can be finalized. My commitment remains strong and as hopeful as when we first met last summer. Sincerely yours in Christ, Most Reverend Robert J. Carlson, Archbishop of St. Louis. For most St. Stanislaus parishioners, it was hard to understand why the board members, as well as Father Marek Bozek, had been excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. In a 2005 interview with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, St. Stanislaus parishioner Vicki Aiken said, St. Stanislaus has been my home, and it will stay in my heart. She continued on to say, It is difficult to understand how people who have done horrific things to children are still a part of the church. They have not been excommunicated. At the time, uh, the person who was president of the board of directors was Joe Rudofsky, Dr. Joe Rudofsky. Um, he, um, he was presented with an ultimatum uh, by Cardinal Regali that they needed to give up all their um, assets and um, sign everything over and reincorporate. Um, basically, the directors stood their ground um, and they weren't willing to do this. Uh, they were wanting to get the community to know what was going on, um, but uh, they were afraid that um, the archdiocese would actually uh, cause a problem with them. Um, so they asked for a meeting with me. Um, they knew that I had some contacts in the media and with uh, some uh, businessmen in the St. Louis area. Um, and they wanted to see what I could actually help with in the situation. Um, after we had our initial discussion, um, it was determined that we would proceed with two separate groups, one as the board of directors, um, and they would do their own communication from an uh, official stand uh, as being the legal guardians of the parish, the church, the property, the funds. And then I would go forward as the spokesman um, for the parishioners themselves as us having a separate group that the parishioners basically don't want this to occur either. Um, in doing so, we decided to have a meeting um, with the Archbishop then at the time uh, was Burke, uh, Raymond Burke. Um, he had taken over for Archbishop Regali during this process. Um, in that meeting that we had with Archbishop Burke, he, at one point in time, the meeting took almost three hours. We had it at the Archdiocese. And um, at one point in time, he basically told us, you sign over the money and the funds and the property to us or we'll make you spend it. Um, there were, the parish committee was there, um, the administrator at the time, um, who was actually put in place to vacate everything um, and to move the parish over to uh, St. Joseph's and Clayton um, was there and he was actually speaking on behalf of the archbishop. But then at, at a certain point, the archbishop and his attorneys took over the conversation and told us what they wanted. Um, I was kind of hesitant at the beginning when I was talking with the board of directors, um, but after that meeting with the archbishop, um, it really made me angry. The uh, Having been raised as a Catholic um, and knowing um, what I did about the Catholic faith and wanting to not only grow Catholicism in my own family, um, but to um, continue to live a life, you know, as a Catholic citizen and individual of the world and, you know, show good faith. It made me upset that a person who was in charge of a certain point in the, in the Catholic faith as a leader 
um, was acting this way. Um, you know, to me, he, he seemed as if he didn't have any scruples and um, he, he was not a, you know, to put it lightly, he was not a nice man. Um, and that basically, that meeting basically solidified it for me to, to be their representative and to go forward with uh, fighting the process. Although the parishioners of St. Stanislaus wanted to keep their church, some dispute the methods which board members use to show the amount of support for the parish. A former active parishioner who wished to remain anonymous said, I witnessed the meeting between Archbishop Raymond Burke and the parishioners of St. Stanislaus. It was a vendetta organized by the board of directors with the participation of people I saw for the first time. There were priests that were involved in performing uh, sacraments, masses, um, doing various things for our community in the background. Um, we had Jesuits, we had Redemptorists, we had Resurrectionists that were coming in and doing all that stuff for us. And each and every one of them said they, they would do it for the purpose of giving continuing sacraments to the people. In fact, one of the Jesuits that came in, um, one of the homilies he gave to the parish, and I won't forget this, he said, you know, this is an individual that you are fighting. The archbishop is just a man put in a position just like any other person is as a leader. And just keep in mind that you believe in the faith and not in the individual himself. So just keep the faith, the Catholic faith, and know that that's what you're fighting for or not, that you're fighting to protect this other man or for this other man. And um, a lot of individuals took that to heart uh, in the parish and they continued the battle. So um, just simply because we saw those other priests that were willing to step over and do this for the people in the parish and they made those comments and supported us, we knew that it wasn't just. Well, we found out, well, we're parishioners, so we found out they're our parents and the people were always talking about giving us updates. And uh, I think it was just lack, it wasn't wrong, I think lack, lack of communication, greed. You know? I think the church within itself needed reform. If the parishioners did get together and reform within ourselves, I don't think it would, uh, the archdiocese would have weakened. It. it would have been able to do such an easy takeover if um, we were not so divided. I think during that time, it was a time that they had a lot of the uh, sexual molestation cases going on. So they were looking probably at churches they can divide or um, probably close. But St. Stanislaus at that time, you know, had a lot of assets. And they said they guaranteed um, Polish um, St. Stanislaus Parish would always exist. They never said that the um, church will exist. So if you look in the fine print, that was the biggest thing that shouldn't have happened. Not only were parishioners concerned about the way that the archdiocese was going to use the parish funds, parishioners from New Polonia were getting increasingly upset with the board members due to their lack of transparency towards this group. A former parishioner said, Only one person of the parish council was from the New Polonia, but no one belonged to the board of directors who controlled the finances of the parish. They were closed areas. We did not truly know the financial state of the parish or how it was structured. All we as the New Polonia knew was that we were being guilted for not giving enough money. That was the only thing that mattered. In response to the parishioners' complaints about underrepresentation of New Polonia, Father Jacek Novak, who was a former assisting priest at St. Stanislaus, wrote in a letter to the Archdiocese the following. In May, the parishioners requested for the pastor to select two additional directors from the parishioners from Poland, who constituted 90% of the parishioners regularly participating in Sunday Mass. During my ministry at St. Stanislaus Koska Polish Parish, I was concerned by the disrespectful relation of the pastor and members of the board of directors towards Polish society. The voice of Polonia was never taken seriously in matters deciding the future of the parish. The Polish society, which is so vital to this parish, is treated as a subculture and 
threat for the despotic rules of the board of directors. Mr. John Barash, a member of Old Polonia and former board member, said, I love that there were new people coming to the parish, but there began a tug of war for power amongst parishioners. New Polonia wanted to do things that were out of the question for St. Stanislaus. I helped revive this church. They needed to follow the rules that were keeping this church going. Not everything could be for personal use. For example, we needed to rent out the newly built Polish Heritage Center. Additionally, most of these people who were fighting for power didn't have the funds necessary to run a parish like St. Stanislaus. Money. Again, money, 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 because the archdiocese tried to sell the property and take the money. If you have your own church, if you have your own place when you was born, when your parents uh, raised you up, and uh, that was the St. Stanislaw, and then archdiocese come to you and say, get out of your, of your own church because you not give it to us the, your money, which is actually our money, what was that, you know, that was the people's money, not the uh, archdiocese money, but there was a greediness from archdiocese to take this away from us. And I'm not happy for that. You know, uh, I'm the faithful Catholic, but, you know, what the greediness of the money do it, you know, to these people. I don't know who is uh, uh, administration on the archdiocese, who leading what. Maybe Archbishop has nothing to do, uh, do something with that, but he signed the paper. Archbishop Burke was brought in as basically um, a hatchet man. Uh, he had closed the parishes up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, in the same similar fashion. What he'd done up there was he had uh, downsized his archdiocese up there of La Crosse uh, to two out of every five parishes were remaining open. So he, he cleared three uh, out of every five. Uh, he vacated the finances. He sold off the properties. A lot of times he even sold off the statues and the windows. Um, he did a similar thing to St. Aloysius on the hill here in St. Louis, where there were uh, old Italian families that still resided on the hill at the time that they were tearing that church down. Um, and they had their family names on the stained glass windows from donations. Uh, a lot of those families offered to purchase those windows to give funds to the archdiocese in exchange for the glass window so they could keep it in the family. Um, he intentionally sold those off to parishes in states of Louisiana and uh, Mississippi to get them out of the area. Um, put up a chain link fence with uh, barbed wire around the facility as they tore it down. Um, so this man was um, not a good shepherd. Um, and we had people come down for his first meeting that we had at St. Stanislaus. He did not want to hold it in the parish hall. He wanted it in the church itself. Um, and he started the meeting off with telling the parishioners that to deny the archbishop is to deny Christ, um, which did not go over well with the old parishioner base. You know, you're talking about people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who grew up with Catholicism, and now they're being told that the archbishop is God, and um, they got very angry at that. Um, so, you know, he came in to do a job. He was very good at doing that job um, in La Crosse. Um, oh yeah, and the individuals that came down from La Crosse gave us documents um, that showed everything he did up there. We had a sign at that first meeting that showed the names of all the parishes that he actually closed down and why he was here. Um, by the end of the meeting, he admitted that he was down here to close off parishes and that was his job. Um, and that was recorded by the media actually at the time that were there at the meeting as well. Um, so yeah, Regali started it, but he was basically uh, put in that position to be moved so that the hatchet man could come in and do the work. Not only they tried, they they decided that either we will give them or we'll be excommunicated. So why? I already said why. 
the jealousy of being independent and survival, and also be on our own was enormous. Also, some people in the child in the in the uh, in the church was thinking that they will make a law. So when they make a law, we cannot be behind the law. But it was law which they will kind of bend a little bit their way. Example is in St. Joseph's Shrine. Also, the next archbishop was happy with us and say that we will do everything to reverse this if you get out of present pastor, Father Bozek. Now, that was an obstacle because he was official priest and he wanted good from the beginning, but later on, when he was excommunicated and deprived of, of the faculty as a priest, then he couldn't be any more priest. But some people were loyal to him. They say, well, when we had bad time, when we were excommunicated, nobody was, was there to help us, he came. Now, we had before cases when we had to bring the priest out of state and was good priest. He was worried, so he camouflaged him, so to speak, and then say, oh, don't worry about you being incognito and you will see the mass and you will go. And we pay him just to please people so they have Roman Catholic mass. We wanted to be Roman Catholic uh, parish. Whoever is left over right now, he still want to be Roman Catholic, especially on Polish side, because unfortunately, is right now is very little Polish people. Building should belong to Polish people. This building should stay as a Roman Catholic. Unfortunately, we lost case in a, in a court. So. The court decided that, well, because you decided original that you be the, the owner of the church, then you are the owner of the church. And who care about your soul or your religion? As a court, I cannot decide. So <laughs> it was very interesting. I got uh, I got threats um, against myself, against the family. Um, there were individuals that, you know, the kids, a couple of the boys were my my boys went to Viani High School, the girls went to Corriezu, Um and there were um, the nuns actually were very receptive and they were very supportive. Um, there were a few lay individuals at Viani that made comments toward the boys and tried to cause issues for them as far as um, their tenure at the high school and participating in religious activities. Um, the priests and brothers there stepped in and protected them. Um, they were very supportive of us. Again, I didn't meet any clergy that were against us. Um, there were a few that made comments against us that were um, at a higher position or a higher level in the archdiocese at the time, they um, they were on their own because a lot of the other priests didn't support them, and they were actually telling us in the background, writing us letters and making phone calls toward us. Um, the individuals um, 
there's a couple recordings of uh, of uh, radio interviews that I did. Um, I did. I I was doing at least three interviews a week during the height of the thing um, for radio and TV. Um, and I would get nasty phone calls from people that belong to the archdiocese saying that we're dismantling it or causing problems, breaking it apart, uh, further decimating it, um, along with uh, SNAP at the time. Um, SNAP was actually came out and supported us as well because Archbishop Burke was responsible for protecting a few of the pedophile priests up in the lacrosse diocese at the time as well. Um, so they were um, already butting heads with them before he came down. But uh, yeah, I mean, some of the, uh, some of the times I actually uh, went in for uh, interviews, both to the radio station late at night or TV station, I actually did have um, other individuals who were acting as bodyguards for me. Um, I did get attacked at the meeting um, that we had at the church where the microphone was actually broken out of my hand, snapped uh, when I was speaking. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that was going on at the time. Although some people like Mr. Bach experienced physical threats against them, some parishioners were affected more so emotionally and spiritually. One parishioner said, for me personally, it was an extremely stressful time. I suffer from nervous problems to the point of developing serious eczema lesions, which required medical treatment. Isolation from friends was to the point of being ignored when spotted in a store, and even not saying hello while we were waiting in the court hall for the hearing of our statements. I feel terrible that I was excommunicated, but I am a strong believer. I am a strong believer that God is merciful and God needs place to pray. So no one should deprive people of praying praise. So I couldn't change this situation. I couldn't do any different. I pray same or more before excommunication, like same like I was excommunicated. Now I would like to share with you the story of Kazimierz Sigieda, a Polish American veteran. On June 1st, 2005, Kazimierz Sigieda was rushed to the emergency room of the Veterans Administration Hospital in St. Louis. The survivor of Siberia and veteran of the Battle of Monte Cassino was suffering from extremely low blood pressure, a life-threatening situation. Upon his admittance, Segeda informed the hospital staff that he was Roman Catholic. The next day, a Roman Catholic priest visited Segeda. Then they discussed the fact that he is a member of St. Stanislaus Koska Parish, and that Segeda agreed with the actions of the board of directors of the parish, and not with Archbishop Burke. Upon hearing this, the priest refused to give Segeda the Blessed Sacrament and walked out of his room. The biggest regret is that we never took time to, to sit down and, and uh, search for ways to resolve the conflict without uh, the pressure of being excommunicated or, or the pressure of uh, somebody taking away our property. From, from day one, uh, every our action was done under extreme pressure and, and threats and intimidation. So, so there was never a chance for us to sit as, as friends or as Christians and, and pray together and, and discern how we can resolve this challenging situation. I wish we had such a chance. Just uh, better communication with the people. You know, people should have stuck, should have had a meeting, you know, like downstairs when they had. And here's where we need to stick together. You know, there, I think there wasn't no leader, you know. Because mm -hmm. I, th I don't think there. there was nobody strong enough or in good standing with the directors 
because they were approachable. They had like the best interest, you know, some of it, you know, was maybe like the Sopranos, you know, a lot of the board members did get wealthy, um, mm -hmm. but generally they did have the best interest. It was just the Polish community, the other parishioners should have decided to do reform or maybe do elections. Uh, all of that was all decided after the break and there was a lot of reform within it, but I think it was too late. Yeah. I think cooler heads need to, uh, on both sides. Uh, I think Archbishop Burke felt it necessary to exercise extreme authority. But I also think the uh, board members, the St. Polish, uh, St. Stanislaus Polish Church, uh, Kaskin Church, they exercised power again. It was a power play. Um, I think both just simply say, let's just, let's just talk. Let's just talk it through. And we can find some common ground and move forward. Unfortunately, I don't think either side were ready to do that, which is sad. You know, you, you can't compromise on certain things. You, you can't simply say, well, what can we do to keep you to here? Um, basically say, this is what we have. This is our church and we're proud of it. And there are certain expectations as well as there's wonderful benefits, but this is what we are. And you can't, you can't just compromise the rules. Um, to kind of give you an example, when a rich young man came up to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? He said, well, keep the commandments. He goes, well, I do. He said, oh, well, great. Well, sell what you have, give it to the poor, come and join me. And he was very wealthy, and he decided he couldn't do it, so he walked away. Jesus could very easily have said, okay, we'll talk about it. What about half now, half later? He didn't do that. And sadly, this, this rich young man couldn't see himself to take away his, his wealth. So he did walk away. He could have been the 13th apostle, but he chose to do what he felt he needed to do, but the Lord didn't back off. He didn't compromise. So I think at some time you just have to say, this is who we are, this is who we have to be. If you wish to be part of it, great. Let's ride this ride together. Until then, you know, you just have to kind of uh, hopefully get folks who have fallen away to find that they're always welcome back. The ones that quit practicing, I'm, so, I'm sorry that that happened, but on the other hand, hopefully they found some way to be close to God. You know, we actually told the archbishop at one point in time that, um, you know, had he waited five to 10 years from the point of him coming in, that the parish would have been smaller. Um, some of the parishioners would have passed on um, that it may be, at that point where we wouldn't be able to keep it up or maintain it or whatever else, that there would have been some point of negotiation or some something that we could have come up with mutually. Um, he physically told us he wasn't interested in it. He said he wanted it done now and that was it. That was his job, that's why I was there. Um, the Congress of American Bishops brought in their representative, told us that they were supported by or that he was supported by them. Um, we wrote the, uh, the Pope, um, both the Pope and the um, secretary, his secretary, weren't aware of what was happening. That's when, you know, you look at the layers of, the, of the politics and who's in charge and who's actually seeing what's happening. You know, um, Burke had his group of individuals that were there behind him using their official capacities um, backing them and, and making it harder for us um, so no i wouldn't i mean i had so i had parishioners there that went through world war ii stood in front of nazi tanks you know left communism and left their homeland left everything they had for a better life here and then they had somebody that came in with their faith and their religion trying to do the same thing um, and, you know, that might be extreme to some people to think it that way, but that's exactly what it was. I mean, you know, these people um, put their blood into the parish by, you know, having events, uh, keeping the parish clean, putting up decorations on the holidays, you know, singing on the weekends or at mass on a daily basis, uh, you know, doing whatever they had to do to keep it going. And then somebody comes in and says they just want to take it. You know, it just, it wasn't right. Um, so no, I wouldn't have done anything different looking back on it. it. It put a major strain and a toll for several years on me and on my family, um, but um, I wouldn't have changed it.
At this moment, it is almost impossible because they changed the laws because they were they are independent, so they change the law their way. So only possibility are that Polish people will move out or sue the, the priest or uh, I don't know how to fix the, the outcome or to, to benefit, but definitely uh, some solution should be fine. Uh, present uh, archbishop are, are very uh, straightforward that Polish people should take care about this, but Polish people are almost gone because they pick up different parishes, they pick up some agata, and uh, leftover are in tens only instead of hundreds or maybe thousands. St. Agatha is the historical landmark parish designated for the Polish Roman Catholics of St. Louis by the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Despite the host of problems that came with this church that were non-existent at St. Stanislaus, it quickly became the new home for some former St. Stanislaus parishioners, many of whom believe in the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Over the years, a few brave-hearted parishioners have begun trying to restore the parish, including Mr. Susavica, who has been featured in this documentary. Archbishop couldn't do differently. And then he provides money. So financially, he lost because he uh, had to cater to the need of the Polish people. Polish people lost uh, church. Some of them never came back to the Semagata. Semagata is, is the small picture of St. Stanislaus, very small. So that was loss on both, both, both ends. And they still have, they still have uh, uh, cultivated the, the Polish heritage uh, and Polish religion, which is, which is right for people who, who, who go, and we go over there too. There's a lot of things missing. Like I said, the, the new hall they built, uh, St. Stanislaus, that wasn't there. You know, so there were so many things that were missing. Uh, Saint Gatos, they need a lot of help, you know, a lot of work. And so we start here, we go, we start over again, you know. And that generation now they're older, right? They're like, oh, we don't want to deal with this, you know. And then a lot of the younger people, kids, they were like, well, we don't want to deal with it anymore. And they left. Um, about some of the parishes, uh, this Agatha in particular, did it fall in disrepair? Probably. But again, there's no money, and there's not a whole lot of money to uh, to uh, fix these. You know, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars to to do a, a fix up of all the, the facilities in the archdiocese, and there just isn't that kind of money around. Change is inevitable. I mean, if you are alive, you are changing. Basically, it's much more diverse than the original or the older group as you define them. Uh, it's people from every ethnicity, from every uh, national origin and multiple languages as well. So we have become uh, more than just Polish church. Uh, I think our older members uh, proudly say gość w dom, Bóg w dom. And, and, and they use this uh, Polish proverb to justify our opening wide, the church's doors and our minds to the new wave of people. So the, the newcomers are, are from every imaginable uh, way of life. There are many of them have found a new spiritual home here because for one reason or another they fell disenfranchised or, or marginalized either by the Roman Catholic Church or by different denomination. 
Some parishioners from prior to the conflict stayed. Mrs. Ezbieta Shvietnitsky said, Father Marek proved to us his charismatic and deep faith, which led him to serve with the cr true Christian spirit. He shared with the congregation his belief that everyone should be accepted, an open-door church. This was not in agreement with the beliefs of some congregation members, but brought a large number of new members. For the last 17 years, I personally feel happy and spiritually well having Father Marek and assisting priests lead us in our Catholic traditions and providing years of homilies and services with true Christian spirit. On the contrary, Mr. John Barash says, St. Stanislaus is a revolving door. Marek runs the show at St. Stanislaus. He's a sweet talker. He brings in new people on his side so that he can vote his people onto the board. Many parishioners come now and only stay a year. He continues on saying, I am still a parishioner so that I can vote in elections that could bring the church back to the Roman Catholic faith. I wish I knew what would it take. <laughs> uh, do I wish, I think it's possible. I am an eternal optimist. So I think uh, perhaps one day when Pope Margaret calls us and says, please come back to us, we will be happy to say, sure, what do we sign? Uh, at this time, I doubt it will happen in my lifetime or even your lifetime uh, because the, the Roman Catholic canon law basically requires each parish to be uh, legally owned by the Archdiocese of Diocese. Uh, and and the, the people of St. Stanislaus have been traumatized too much to, to entrust the ownership of this church to anyone but their own uh, board of directors. As anyone will tell you, I can be a very uh, clear and divisive person in my uh, positions and statements, and, and people usually feel compelled to take a stand for or against, and, and I th sometimes I wish I could I would be able to, to be more reconciliatory in my statements and positions, but uh, at times I, I think we need to stand for what we believe is right, and we need to say that black is black and white is white. Mr. John Barash says, I would love to see the Church Roman Catholic again. In 2010, we were close to rejoining the Roman Catholic Church. But then he lied and blew things out of the water. He said different things in private conversation than on the pulpit. Uh, I definitely do. I hope uh, Richard can return to being Roman Catholic. Uh, when it's feasible, I hope it is. You know, uh, because I, I still like the people to get back to, to the church. Like I said, uh, it's a shame that uh, you know people got married and we we seen them and then everything got taken away. You know. It's, we have a lot of us have uh, found memories, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we grew up there. We came here as kids, you know. We left, you know, close to our thirties. You know, we left there, you know. Twenties, thirties, we left there. So it, it, it was a shame. If um, Saint Stanislaus was built by the Polish people, so it was the Polish community that built the church. Um, it wasn't through we didn't accept money through the archdiocese. It was all Polish, Polish made. Polish, you know, so it, it does still belong to the Polish people and it should come back. Yeah. Saint Stanislaw is my home, it's my house. Because my faith, my everything was there. I put my heart on that church. Now they tell me, okay, go to the different place and put your heart in a different place. It's not work like it's like this you have wife and they tell you, okay, go to go to, go to your neighbor's uh, wife or go to your neighbor's girl. And try to lie with her and uh, look and tell your wife how she's tried to do by herself. It's very hard. It's actually, you know, that's how it is. Well, it'd be nice for it to, to revert back to the Roman Catholic Church. But 
um, as I said, with the current leadership that's in place, you know, they've already established that there's going to be more downsizing in the archdiocese, and they're planning on doing that and accomplishing it by 2023. Um, so there really isn't any hope as far as the physical reunification of the church to the archdiocese. Uh, maybe someday in the future there will be. We've uh, written letters and requested that it be made into a museum or even just a shrine so that it could be used periodically uh, for weddings or whatever else. Um, but we've been refused that because basically the diocese is just interested in taking over the property. They don't care about the parish itself or the health of the parish itself. Um, so, uh, you know, you'd like to see something happen to it uh, eventually, but um, staying as it is right now, um, you know, some people look at it as it's just a building, but um, there's a lot of history to that building. A lot of families have had weddings and first communions and uh, baptisms and things in that parish that they'll remember forever, graduated when it was still a grade school. Um, and it's been part of the St. Louis community, both, you know, for firemen and for police. I mean, they'll still talk about it. There were several celebrities because it was known as the Cathedral of North St. Louis at one point because it was the second largest capacity behind the uh, cathedral in Lindell for holding uh, funerals and, and uh, things for dignitaries. Um, it was close to downtown as well. So, um, you know, people in St. Louis will remember it. Um, what happens to that neighborhood, you know, it's coming back. It's going to be rejuvenated. The plans are set that within the next 15 to 20 years, there's going to be a vital neighborhood around it. Um, not only with NGA being a functional uh, employer, but we'll actually have new residences and apartment buildings and, you know, all kinds of new uh, living space with retail around there as well. So, um, hopefully it'll become part of the community and people will keep it up. But uh, in order to protect it, it's it's the way it is. It's it's a separate corporation. So right now it's the way it is. It's uh, being maintained and, and uh, kept. Uh, hopefully uh, it'll be that way for a while. The very fact that I speak with a thick Polish accent <laughs> is one of the proofs that uh, we are Polish and we are Catholics. Uh, if everything goes well, I'm, uh, I believe that my successor will also be a Polish person and that uh, Polish masses and Polish prayers will continue to be said and sang in this church for decades, hopefully for centuries to come. So the Polishness of, of this congregation is in no danger of disappearing. We're going to change paths. But from inside of the pairs was when one of the meeting was mother of the, of, the, of the priest who quoted Bible that the church belongs to people in, in general. I was myself quoted that give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give God what belongs to God. And we, an archbishop, didn't agree on this. We wanted God and Caesar. It didn't work. It didn't work for us, and it didn't work for him. It would be a, a great uh, blessing, and a, it would be uh, true to the heritage of uh, the establishment of St. Stanislaus, Polish Roman Catholic Church, if it were truly Roman Catholic again. Some Roman Catholic Church officials agreed to be a part of this documentary by providing written statements. Archbishop Emeritus Carlson agreed to provide a reflective statement, but a response is still pending. In a formal statement, Cardinal Justin Regali said, the Polish community in St. Louis still remains very dear to the church as it did when I was archbishop. It is sad that the parish is no longer a part of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. 
Cardinal Raymond Burke did not respond to multiple requests for a reflective statement about the lawsuit between the Archdiocese of St. Louis and St. Stanislaus Kostka Parish. Father Philip Benet declined to be interviewed and was unresponsive to a request for comment in regards to the conflict of St. Stanislaus. While declining an interview, he stated, The St. Stanislaus events which culminated in the separation from the Roman Catholic Church were very emotional for all involved. Accordingly, I am reticent to lend my name to an account of the history of the conflict there. Therefore, I politely decline your invitation. The conflict, excommunications, and the lawsuit followed by the Archdiocese of St. Louis caused divisions within the St. Stanislaus Kostka Parish. Some parishioners left their Roman Catholic faith and decided to stay at St. Stanislaus, feeling the need to protect their parish. Others followed the requests of the Archdiocese and adopted St. Agatha's Church as their new Polish Roman Catholic Church, as designated by Archbishop Burke. Some other parishioners became members of American parishes, and most sadly, some stopped attending Roman Catholic Church. As we dive deeper into All Things New initiative at our Archdiocese of St. Louis, it is important to learn from the past and plan wisely how we go about making changes in our Roman Catholic Church. With the current war in Ukraine, it is possible that history might repeat itself and we might receive a new influx of Ukrainians or Polish refugees to St. Louis. Will St. Stanislaus Koska Corporation welcome the new Roman Catholic refugees and allow them to practice Roman Catholic faith at St. Stanislaus Church as the original founders of the St. Stanislaus Church intended? The compelling stories shared by people about St. Stanislaus Koska Parish in this documentary bring the following questions to mind. Why was it so hard for the new Polonia from the 1980s join the board of directors of St. Stanislaus, considering that they made up most of the active group of regular worshipers? Why didn't the directors have term limits while serving on the board? Why did they hold on to their director position so tightly and were not willing for anyone else to join. Was it the right thing to do for Father Marek Bozer to accept the position of a new pastor of St. Stanislaus Koska Church, knowing that his stay would cause a lot of controversies in St. Louis and further divisions within the St. Stanislaus Parish? Was it a wise idea for the Archdiocese of St. Louis to file a lawsuit against the St. Stanislaus Koska Board of Directors and attempt to dissolve the corporation? Would a more peaceful approach to solve problems with the Board of Directors yield better results? Was the traditional leadership used by the Archdiocese and Archbishop Burke to bring about financial compliance the best strategy? Is it more important for the Roman Catholic Church to be uniformed or united? Would a servant leadership style approach bring better results? Was excommunicating all the Board of Directors and Father Marek Bozek necessary and just was it the right timing for the Archdiocese to expect financial compliance? Why couldn't the compromise suggested by Archbishop Carlson be accepted? Could St. Stanislaus Polish Parish remain a corporation while serving Polish Roman Catholic as it did for over a hundred years? Was justice done to the Polish American Roman Catholics of St. Louis? What are we as Roman Catholics willing to do about it? What is our Roman Catholic leadership wanting to do about it? Well, this is my call to action. Save St. Stanislaus Kostka Polish Roman Catholic Parish. It's never too late. Kajdan i samych siebie, a Chrystus stając się braty, nauczył nas wołać do Ciebie. Zapuść 
ta przenika naszą codzienność i pokazuje nam Ciebie.